it is my privilege to introduce to you yet again our speaker for this evening, Professor Philip Johnson. Uh, notice how far I have to pull that microphone down. Uh, I, uh, that's my lot in life. My wife uh, sometimes refers to me as the shrimp uh, because I have to put the car seat so far forward after she's been driving. <laughs> it's a, always a great pleasure to visit this community, this lovely church community, and uh, the uh, people that uh, Mark brings in that uh, that I can meet, and even to remember the uh, great uh, times in the year in uh, England uh, when we met and when I was first beginning to take up the uh, study of uh, Darwinism. And now, years later, I've got four books um, with a fifth uh, coming out in July titled The The Wedge of Truth. Uh, And we have what I think is a burgeoning public controversy uh, that's going to get hotter in the next decade. I I believe it's going to be one of the major issues on the cultural radar screen in the coming decade. And we're giving you uh, this week a two-part presentation uh, on this issue. I'd very much urge you to come on Wednesday to hear my colleague Steve Meyer, uh, the uh, professor of philosophy of science, uh, uh, who will be here at this hour on a Wednesday evening to explain the information content of a DNA and the protein synthesis system of the cell. This is really the intellectual heart of the intelligent design case, explaining the role of genetic information in the life processes and the reasons why it is not rational to believe that uh, the information quality and quantity can be uh, produced by the naturalistic processes of chance and physical law. So, of course, I'm not going to try to duplicate that uh, presentation. That's what's uh, coming. What I'm trying to do uh, tonight is to set the stage for it, to explain the background of the cultural controversy over the Darwinian theory of evolution and the materialist or naturalistic thinking that it uh, represents. And then I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to the material that Steve Meyer will be teaching Uh, in in, uh, much greater depth on uh, Wednesday night. When I was here a few months ago, uh, I began with the story of the Kansas controversy of uh, last uh, August uh, and how the Kansas State Board of Education had uh, uh, rebelled against a draft of science standards presented to it by a large committee of science educators and had said, well, um, we regard this subject as being considerably oversold, as uh, overhyped, and we believe that the theory of evolution is genuinely scientific only at the level at which the process is actually observed. That is the process of what is often called microevolution, of um, the breeding of domestic animals, of mosquitoes becoming resistant to insecticides, uh, when they're sprayed repeatedly over many generations by DDT, of uh, disease-causing bacteria becoming resistant to penicillin and similar drugs so that those drugs uh, don't work well anymore. That all that's completely scientific and we have no problem with it. Uh, But when uh, the science educators say that the same process merely continued over a very long period is responsible for how you get animals and mosquitoes Uh, and people for the mosquitoes to bite in the first place, uh, then that is a philosophical uh, extension which is not uh, fully justified by the scientific evidence. And so the board said, we are uh, not going to forbid anybody to teach anything. We're not going to remove anything from the uh, curriculum in that sense. But in our statewide standards, which are enforced by statewide mandatory testing, we are going to test the students only for uh, the microevolutionary knowledge, only for the parts that we see as genuinely scientific. And so we won't require the teachers to teach that these same processes are responsible for the whole history of life, the whole uh, creation process. Now, um, 
That um, uh, led to a media firestorm, again, which I talked about last time. And I, I'm not embarrassed at all to start at the same place ag again this time, because the controversy is still very much alive. Indeed, uh, just two hours ago, as I was about to go down to dinner, uh, I was interrupted by a call from the Associated Press reporter who wanted me to react to certain statements that Professor Stephen Jay Gould had made about the Kansas controversy. And, so, and, and it's still ongoing thing. What, he, what Gould had said was uh, nobody should worry about it because it's a, just an American phenomenon and it's not going on in Europe and Asia, and so it's nothing to worry about. Um, that's not quite true, although there is a, quite a large element of truth in the sense that it's in the United States. We have a mass movement, uh, but uh, our scientific people uh, are all over the world. However, uh, that, that indicated that uh, people are still talking about that controversy, and there's still a great level of, of concern uh, about it. Now, um, in, in understanding this level of concern, um, it's important to keep in mind that despite the reports that you may have read about this situation, the Kansas Board didn't forbid anybody to teach anything, and they did not remove the teaching of evolution from the schools. Those are widely reported you know, facts in all the press, but they're not true. That they teach evolution, mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, the, you know, the whole bag of scientific concepts uh, in the sense in which I just described. And because that's the case, the actual difference in teaching that the change in standards might have made is a little bit hard to tell. It's hard to tell whether it would make any difference at all. And if there were any difference, it would be very slight. No teacher is required to change anything. The teachers can go on teaching before if they, they want to. And as far as I know, most of them uh, would. But even if they do make a change and eliminate the macroevolution, you see, it's basically the same thing. They're going to be teaching the same subject anyway and calling it microevolution. What would be different, if anything is, is at the end of that they'd say, and now this accounts for the whole history of life, if you, you know, leave it going long enough. Or they would say, it doesn't account for the whole history of life if you leave it going long enough, or we're not saying anything about that one way or the other. You see, it would, in terms of the amount of classroom time taken, it would be a very small amount. And it would if be a lapse in education, if it is a lapse in education, that could be very quickly and easily remedied, remedied at, let's say, the college level. Uh, so uh, the educational content uh, was minimal. And yet there was a worldwide media firestorm. And the fact of that firestorm is my starting point in addressing the issues uh, you know, that are here. Why is it? that newspaper editors and scientific authorities in Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., uh, London, around the world, uh, treated this as a major event and a major cause for concern. Why was it on page one week after week? The Washington Post led off with a page 1A a story uh, three days before the Kansas board uh, announced its action, a story saying that they were going to remove virtually all references to evolution from the curriculum, by the way. Now, written in good faith, I'm sure, but, not, but, but somewhat misleading in that respect. Uh, why are editor, editors uh, pounding the table all around the country, denouncing the Kansas board and saying this must be stopped? Why did the editor of Scientific American, the leading journal for general science, uh, John, the editor John Rennie, propose that scientists sitting on college admissions boards should deny admission to colleges for students who are graduates of Kansas high schools? And in order, he said, to show parents that this kind of action has consequences for their children. That's rather heavy handed. I don't believe that that's been done, by the way, but, uh, um, but uh, that it was proposed and by other scientific authorities as well uh, is an indication of how strong the feeling and you might say the fear or panic reaction was uh, uh, to this uh, uh, action. Now, you would be extremely naive if you were to think that this was because they were deeply concerned about how adequately educated the high schoolers in Kansas are. This is not a subject which preoccupies the editors of the Washington Post, the London newspapers, and the New York Times. Um, if you ask them whether they teach algebra or trigonometry or calculus in the Kansas high schools, I'm sure they couldn't tell you. And, of course, if you were concerned about the scientific preparation of high school students, that's what you'd want to know. How much math do they learn? Uh, I'm sure that uh, they don't know whether those students read a play of Shakespeare 
uh, for example, or, or what else that they take, nor do they care. Uh, that is not what is preoccupying the editors of those uh, papers. Uh, why then are they so concerned? Uh, why do they feel it's so important to denounce and to stop this uh, rebellion uh, in its tracks? Well, the reason, of course, is that what is understood to be at stake here is a worldview, a worldview that permeates the culture uh, at every level and affects it on uh, every issue. And the, the worldview issue is whether rational people for intellectual purposes in the educational world and in the world of government and lawmaking are to take for granted that science has shown us that natural processes that have been discovered by scientific investigation, specifically the processes of physical law and chance, of random mutation and natural selection, that these processes are capable of creating the forms of life that exist and actually did so. Uh, so that belief in God as creator, while not necessarily ruled out by these discoveries, is made unnecessary. You can believe in God if you have a strong enough motivation to do so, but if you don't have that strong a motivation, you can discard the poor fellow uh, just as readily, because the process of nature and of creation of life and uh, of all the complex forms that life exist gets along perfectly well without it. It's unnecessary. The, we have no need of that hypothesis. And that that is what is at stake, is the status of that worldview as the defining approach for education at all levels and in all parts of the country and for all purposes. Now, what I'm going to do tonight is to give you a sketch of how the Orthodox Party, the dominant party, the, the Darwinists, one might say, or the scientific materialists, or the metaphysical naturalists, those are all different language for describing fundamentally the same phenomenon, how they see the issue, what their major points are, uh, then why they're so concerned, the background in public opinion and the culture that makes them so concerned, then the outline of what the basic elements of the position that I represent, and that is beginning to come to the fore as the leading challenge to this position, the intelligent design position, uh, what the basic elements of our position are, um, and then, of course, those that will be articulated more completely by Professor Meyer in his uh, Wednesday uh, 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 lecture. Um, and then um, I'm going to conclude by indicating how I think we might most appropriately, as a culture and as a governmental system, approach this, uh, this issue and this uh, growing debate. Now, first then, um, how do the Darwinists see the issue? Of course, what I'm going to give you are the most basic points. And uh, if you say, well, isn't this simplifying it? Aren't there much more complex things that you could go into? Of course, the answer is yes. That would always be the case with a... Uh, one hour presentation of a, of a complex subject. But uh, I think you will find that um, these are the basic fundamental points on which the uh, Darwinian establishment and the scientific materialist establishment are insistent and that define the controversy. Uh, of, of, of three points. First, the beginning assumption is that science and naturalism are inseparable. A scientific explanation is a naturalistic explanation, which is to say an explanation in terms of two basic kinds of things, chance and physical law. It's an explanation that, that explains things in, uh, in, in those uh, terms. Now, naturalism, as I use the term, uh, means simply that for scientific purposes at least, probably for all purposes, we assume that nature is all there is. Or you could put it in a little bit differently way, you could say nature is an autonomous realm which is self-contained and which cannot be influenced by anything from outside of nature, by anything supernatural, you say. So nature is an autonomous, self-enclosed realm. It's either all there is or for as far as we can tell, it's all there is. Uh, it's all that we can have any contact with. And so that being the case, nature has to have whatever it takes to do its own creating. Otherwise, the creating wouldn't get done. Uh, so um, uh, everything that is created 
can be explained, its origins can be explained in terms of the things that are available to nature. Now, um, that means, of course, that you, you can't start out uh, by saying that how did human beings or, for that matter, bacteria uh, come into existence? You couldn't say, well, they just popped out of the void and there they were. You see, that's a supernatural act. That's a miracle. That's a, a supernatural creation, whatever you call it. And so that's absolutely out of the question. And uh, to explain everything in terms of natural processes, you must start with the simplest possible thing, matter in mindless motion. Now, of course, you start with something already in existence and somebody can say, well, where did that come from? Well, everybody has to start somewhere. And say, so if you're, if you're a naturalist, you want to start with the simplest possible thing. If somebody says, well, didn't God have to create the matter? You say, well, I can play your game. Who created God? And so you have to start somewhere, too, you see us. So we start with matter in motion. Uh, in the beginning were the particles, the fundamental particles and the laws of nature, the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry. And uh, everything that has come into existence has come into existence as a result of an unbroken system of law and chance going back to the ultimate beginning, the Big Bang or whatever you want to call the uh, ultimate beginning. And so um, uh, that is simply taken for granted as a definitional starting point. Now, because you take this for granted, there are certain questions which do not arise. For example, you could not ask, does matter have the capacity to form itself into complex, in, into a living organism? Does, does, do non-living chemicals have that capacity? The answer must be, well, of course they do, or rather, at least they did so once. You see, at least that must have happened once, because uh, uh, the, the only proof that we need that this is true is that living organisms exist. And they could not exist if they could not come into existence. You can't start with them already in existence because that would violate the naturalistic starting point. And so there must be a process of chemical evolution by which those chemicals can produce a life form. And, and so if you ask the question, is that really true, you're already out of bounds. It's taken for granted true. The question that is open for scientific investigation is what is the precise pathway? Now, I use this example of the ultimate origin of life on Earth because it's well known to everyone who's familiar with the literature that this is a field in which the experimental work has not been going well for many decades. Um, I was uh, recently at a conference with a, the, the world's leading practitioner of prebiotic evolution, the Nobel Prize winning biochemist Christian de Duve, and when asked for an experimental verification of his view that there are laws of nature which will produce life from non-living chemicals, he cited the Miller-Urey experiment of 1952 as the best experiment. And say, so he's getting an experiment that's almost 50 years old. And that also, if you're familiar with the data, you know actually is not believed to have anything to do with the conditions that actually existed on the early Earth. And it only involves producing a couple of the chemicals that are necessary uh, for the, the, the process. And it's a very weak experimental basis for a field. And the fact that there hasn't been something more spectacular in the 50 years since, since a whole lot really differentiates it from, you know, most viable and growing fields of science. Yet, although this is a field that people stay, tend to stay away from, people don't go into it anymore because it isn't going anywhere. Um, nonetheless, the museum exhibits and the presentations of this to the, fact, to the public will show an absolute confidence that the solution is just around the corner. We either know the answer already virtually or we're about to find it, one or the other, and they amount to the same thing, uh, because we know that it's there to be found. Perhaps the most spectacular indication of that confidence came when it was discovered that um, life seems to have existed from the early, almost the earliest days of the planet, when it cooled enough so that life could exist. Um, and so there was not an unlimited amount of time for the life to arise by chemical evolution. Now, that, that before that, the researchers had said, you know, isn't it wonderful we have so much time because anything can happen in a couple of billion years. Well, it turned out there wasn't much time. And so Carl Sagan announced that this was extremely encouraging, that we now knew that the chemical origin of life must be a much easier process than we had realized because it happened so quickly on the early Earth. 
So science and naturalism are inseparable. There must be a naturalistic mechanism to explain all the creating you know, that has been done. That's point number one, and it's the crucial one. And so something that appeals to a supernatural force or being, such as God, is out of court from the very beginning. Second, what is evolution? Evolution is the process, you see, that does this creating. How do we define it? Evolution is change. Specifically, the textbook definitions will say it's change over time or changes in gene frequencies in a population. And that's what it is. It's change. And the question that they will present, that the National Academy of Sciences, for example, will say is the proper question to address in any debate of this sort, is does evolution occur or does it not occur? Has there ever been any change or has there never been any change? That is how they formulate the issue. Well, of course, with the issue formulated that way, it's obvious that the answer is, sure, of course, evolution does occur. We breed cats and dogs and roses and uh, mosquitoes become resistant to insecticide. These are all the most common examples of evolution, you know, occurring under our vision uh, that happen. Um, and uh, so, of course, they happen. Indeed, I like to sort of say if, that if, if somebody now leaves this room to go to the bathroom, evolution has occurred because there's been a change in the genetic composition of this population. Or if somebody else uh, enters, when a baby is born, evolution has occurred because it's, gene you know, in a minor sense, it's genetically distinct from its uh, parents. Uh, so uh, that leaves nothing whatsoever to debate. You know, change has occurred, evolution has changed. And the corollary of this proposition that evolution is change is that little changes add up to big changes if there's enough time. Now, it is this doctrine that made it appear to the scientific authorities so unreasonable that the Kansas State Board of Education uh, said, well, little change doesn't necessarily add up to big change. You see, we accept the little change, the micro change, but not the macro evolution, not the entire uh, history of, of, of life uh, on that uh, basis. And point of fact, this distinction has often been drawn in the scientific literature. It's all over there, uh, the literature. But the scientific authorities who addressed the Kansas, uh, 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 issue, Kansas issue uh, acted as if they had never heard of such a distinction being drawn before. Um, in particular, Dr. Maxine Singer, the, uh, speaking essentially for the scientific establishment in the Washington Post, said that these Kansas people say they have scientific arguments, but they betray themselves when they admit that you know, changes occur within species all the time, and then they deny for some religious, out of some religious prejudice, that this explains how humans evolved from apes. They say that only a religious prejudice would get you to draw such a foolish distinction. Now, um, I, to make it clear what the doctrine is here, uh, I like to use a homely little example, you know, to, to, to show to people. A little change adds up to big change. If in, within a, you know, a short period of time, as we observe it, mosquitoes can become resistant to insecticide, then over a long time, period of time, mosquitoes can change into something fundamentally different. Or bacteria can change into mosquitoes, you say, by the same process extrapolated. And uh, think of a, a bathtub which has a leaking faucet. See, and, and it leaks very little. It's just one drop a minute. And that's micro water. Very little water. But if the bathtub is stoppered up and you don't fix the leak, then in time you will assuredly get macro water. The bathtub will become filled up. And if I were to say, oh, but, you know, I've read in the Bible that bathtubs only get half full and never more than that, you know, or, or from some other source, you see, then this would be an extremely irrational limitation on this process. Of course, there's no reason why it should stop when the bathtub is half full. It will continue until it's overflowing. Uh, um, micro water plus time adds up to macro water. And you can calculate the rate so you even know when it's going to happen. But now, if you were to change the example and say, well, if one drop of water comes in every minute, how long will it be until the bathtub is filled up with vintage Chateau Neuf du Pape <laughs> or aviation gasoline? And see, then you're dealing with something different. The, you know, that then the, the, uh, it, it is a, a transformation process, and adding drops of water isn't even uh, starting you on that uh, a process. And, of course, you see, that's the, the, the difference between the people 
uh, who say that uh, the, the, the creative process that got you mosquitoes in the first place and people for them to bite is fundamentally different from this process of minor cyclical change that produces things like resistance to insecticide. But the, um, the scientific establishment insists that there is no difference. Now, I, I want to head off a possible criticism. Um, it is true, of course, that if you look at the scientific literature, you'll find a, a range of opinions on this. I've already indicated that the micro-macro distinction is over the literature. And I, I meet people all the time who will say um, that this description is a caricature, that no scientist believes anymore that these micro changes add up to macro uh, changes, that we now have sophisticated concepts like self-organizing systems and genetic algorithms and so on. But don't take that too seriously. If that is true, the National Academy of Sciences hasn't heard about it yet. They say that, that the, the official line that they take in response to public debate and so on is that, you know, uh, micro change adds up to macro change and it's quite sufficient to do it. Um, some other processes may be at work. Uh, they're not, you know, that, that's possible. But, but the, the, these existing ones of, of uh, small-scale step-by-step change are adequate. You don't need anything else. And that, that is their official position, uh, even though there is, you know, more free-ranging discussion within the scientific community. Now, the, that's the second, you see, is that first, science and naturalism are inseparable. Second, Evolution is just change, and little change adds up to big change if you have enough time. And third, what I call the inherit the wind stereotype. Anybody who resists the previous two uh, propositions or um, uh, the, the basics of evolutionary theory is a religious fundamentalist or a highly prejudiced person who is just refusing to look the facts in the face. You see, is saying, I'm not going, don't, don't, uh, 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 tell me to look through your microscopes or your telescopes or to see your evidence. Uh, I'm just something my Bible here. You know, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And that this is the only reason why anybody would be resistant what, to what is so obviously true. Um, and hence, and I have an immense amount of experience in dealing with this, debating it in university circles and so on, the ever-present tendency of the scientific materialists in approaching this controversy is not to ask, do these people have any decent arguments? No, it's taken for granted that they do not. You see, if they are challenging the naturalistic evolutionary process at a fundamental level rather than merely, you know, debating the details of precisely how it happened, they are by definition irrational. So the question is not whether they have any good arguments. It's what are their motives, overt or covert, you know, in the open or hidden, for denying what all reasonable people must obviously know to be true. So, you know, if, if you're a country uh, person who's not terribly well educated, they'll say, well, you're, it's excusable, you're, you know, just not very bright, you haven't been well educated. If you're like a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, you can't have that excuse. You must be an evil person with a, you know, some hit, so what is the hidden agenda then becomes uh, the issue. And this is approached as a culture war topic. And, and you can see three books have come out to recently attacking me and the movement from university presses from, uh, and the like. And uh, they're all in this culture war mode. You know, these people are trying to undermine science. They want us to be uh, ignorant. They uh, have some bad motives, uh, they're utterly perverse, and perhaps they want the country to be ruled by an ayatollah, as in Iran. And they have some motive like this for uh, criticizing what everybody knows uh, to be true. Now, that brings me to the next division of this. That's, you know, the inherit the wind stereotype is the third point in the official belief system. Now, why are they so worried? Well, it's because there's a lot of us evil-minded, ignorant, malicious people out there. Um, that, that is, is the tremendous level of uh, concern. The uh, science educators are very well aware um, that Gallup polls taken over the past a couple of decades have shown virtually no change in public opinion. And it's a very dicey situation for them. Uh, the polls show that if you ask uh, a representative sample of the American public uh, about this, uh, the first question they ask, they ask, do you agree with certain specific statements? And the first one is, do you agree with this statement? God created man pretty much in his present form sometime during the last 10,000 years. And about 44% of the country answers yes to that. So they are defined as, you know, what you might say, hardcore biblical creationists. Um, I always have to point out that you notice the question only asks about man, about human beings. And uh, so it's perfectly consistent with believing in a long process of animal evolution before that point. 
for, for what that's worth. And you always have these sorts of questions with uh, uh, public opinion polls. I don't believe that there are as many as 44 percent, you know, the country who are young earth biblical creationists. But it's still a very large number. Um, another like number of people, a very similar number of people, will say that they believe in a process of God-guided evolution. God brought man into existence over millions of years by an evolutionary process directed uh, and uh, promoted by God. Now, um, it is very unclear, and it's kept deliberately unclear, whether these people should be uh, labeled as evolutionists or creationists. See, they, they probably mostly think that they've combined the two, you know, that that's science and religion come together and everybody's happy. A lion lays down with a lamb and there's no problem. But insofar as they think that, they are mistaken. Uh, and again, this is a matter in which the scientific authorities all agree with me, uh, but they, they, they prefer not to make it clear in uh, public uh, uh, because they don't want the numbers to run so uh, hard against them. But the scientific definition of evolution is that it is a purely naturalistic process, and it would not be scientific if it were not. Remember, science and naturalism are inseparable. You see, so God-guided evolution is not evolution at all because it involves a supernatural being who is interfering and guiding it. So, so you have an unevolved intelligence directing the process. That's, that's what I call soft core creationism. And uh, it's not evolution at all. Uh, uh, evolution has to be unguided to be naturalistic. It can't be guided until it produces genetic engineers. You see, and then that's evolution taking charge of itself, and it can be guided uh, after that uh, point. Uh, but that's basic, as I say. They, they all know that this is the case. Everybody agrees with that. So if, it, it, it turns out that, you know, the, this, these are very alarming public opinion figures, uh, that something like 10% of the country According to the poll results, how, you know, which shouldn't, they're not absolutely airtight, but they're the best evidence we have. Uh, about 10% of the country accepts the official scientific view that we, uh, human beings evolved through a naturalistic process in which God played no part. Uh, then another set of polls shows that the country um, uh, basically takes the view um, that um, in this area, uh, uh, when you have a controversy, the the schools should teach both sides. Uh, so um, uh, about two thirds of the people who respond to polls say that it's appropriate for somehow for both creation and evolution to be presented as alternatives in uh, education. And that, of course, is a position which is total anathema to the scientific establishment and the science educators. There are not two positions in their view. There's only one. You know, or the two positions are right and wrong that it is as absurd to suggest that there is a legitimate dissenting view about uh, biological evolution as to say that the student who says that 2 plus 2 equals 5 is a brave dissenter, you know, in the arithmetic class, you know, who should be rewarded for his imaginative thinking. Uh, no, that's a mistake, and not believing in uh, uh, naturalistic evolution is really not understanding, the, you know, the scientific issues. So that creates, you see, the, the problem and the fact that many political candidates naturally will endorse what uh, two-thirds of the public thinks, including George uh, W. Bush. And what was amusing uh, uh, when, when this first came up a few months ago uh, was that on the, his first reaction, uh, Vice President Gore endorsed the same position. Uh, but he was hammered in the Washington Post and elsewhere and then uh, changed his position to one more congenial to the uh, science uh, educators. So they are aware that they have a difficult position, and this takes tangible form, the, the, the political problem. In the original Washington Post story reporting on the Kansas events, the reporter noted that uh, uh, a, a suburban Kansas City a teacher who said that um, a, you know, a, a large proportion of the students in his biology class wrote at the end of the year they didn't believe a word that he said about evolution. You see, they had been hearing from alternative sources, from the uh, creation-friendly groups and so on. Um, and uh, so uh, they're meeting a lot of uh, debate from students in, in the colleges as well. Many professors are extremely upset that they have students who are not persuaded that um, you can illustrate the process by which plants and animals got created by citing, you know, mosquitoes becoming resistant to insecticide. Um, and uh, by citing, a, you know, certain selected fossil examples as evidence of the evolutionary history. So um, uh, this is the state um, of the uh, controversy. Now, um, 
what has, what has happened that is new in the situation uh, is the emergence of the intelligent design movement with which I am associated as uh, uh, a, a body of academically qualified people uh, presenting an alternative way of thinking about this uh, controversy. Uh, we believe that there is a very legitimate issue and question here which goes way beyond narrow questions of scientific theory and matters of professional scientific interest, uh, which should be addressed in the universities in the first place and then eventually down through the uh, culture. Um, and that the issue has been uh, suppressed because it has been forced within this inherit the wind stereotype that I have uh, described. And uh, so that um, whenever you try to raise a question about Darwinian evolution, the reaction you get in the press um, is that they will cite the Scopes trial of 1925. They'll say that biblical fundamentalists are always trying to censor science and stop it from being taught uh, and that these people are coming in and waving their Bibles again. Uh, and it is a combat between, you know, the, the fundamentalist Bible believers on the one hand and scientific evidence on the other. Um, and uh, that that's all you need to know about it. Um, and uh, when it's put that way, of course, one side inherently has uh, uh, the upper hand. Um, well, what is our starting point? Uh, it, it's a starting point which leaves the Bible entirely out of the uh, question and starts with the statement that it appears that we have two definitions of science in our culture. And the, the starting point in clearing up the confusion is to differentiate between the two definitions. See, one definition of science, the one that I approve of, is that science is a process of empirical testing, of observational investigation, and then evaluating the evidence impartially, without prejudice. That's why science had to be independent of any religious or political authority so that it can do that. Um, that's, that's, that's fine, and that science so defined is what gives us technology, you see, is it experimental testing and following the evidence without uh, prejudice. Uh, but there's a second definition, and it's really quite different. And by the second definition, science is applied materialist or naturalistic philosophy. And so the, the, you know, the science is an effort to explain everything in terms of uh, uh, purely natural forces, regardless of the evidence. In fact, you don't need any evidence in, or, you know, in order to get the basic starting point. You'll recall I said that Richard Dawkins and other Darwinists uh, will tell you that if life exists on the other side of the universe, um, or a place where we can never visit, we can be certain that it evolved by Darwinian means, say, and by a combination of chance and law and of random mutation and natural selection. And why? Because what else could have happened? Hey, this is the only naturalistic explanation that really holds any water, that really holds any you know, uh, uh, substantial uh, uh, scientific support. So there is no alternative. Well, you say, well, what if God had to play a part? Oh, that's religion, you say. Uh, we're not talking about religion here. We're talking about what really happened. Um, and uh, so it, it must be a naturalistic, regardless of the evidence. So we say it should be a question to be evaluated impartially on the basis of evidence whether naturalism is true. Or, to, you know, to put a, in a concrete example, whether those non-living chemicals really can spontaneously combine to form a... Uh, uh, living organism. If you're unprejudiced on the matter, what does the data tend to show? What does the experimental testing tend to show? That's the scientific approach. Not saying that we know the answer without before we do the research. We're only trying to fill in the details uh, when we uh, do the research. So we take on this first crucial assumption that science and naturalism are inseparable, and we say that they can be separated. Now, we have to meet the argument, of course, that is frequently made and maybe in the minds of many of you. Well, of course, science can only study what science can study, and it can only study nature. So, so it inherently can only study natural things. So it wouldn't be science if it weren't restricted in that way. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, this is the wrong way uh, to look at it. Science studies only the natural system and the products of it. Uh, you know, that's what it's observing. It's observing the life processes. But whether those processes that they can study point to a reality outside of science or the need to, of a reality outside of science is another question. You see that the evidence, fairly considered and without prejudice, might show that they don't. 
uh, that the processes of mutation and selection or whatever other materialistic processes are proposed might be so well supported by experimental testing that you can see they were capable of doing all the creating, and so there is no need for anything outside of nature to be involved. On the other hand, they might show the opposite. They might show that the qualities that you can observe in living organisms are of the kind that could only be produced by a pre-existing intelligence, you see. And then the evidence tends to support the need for something in the nature of a creator, something that can provide the necessary intelligence. So that's the question that we present. Instead of starting dogmatically, we put the basic issue up for scientific investigation and testing. Now, our second point, likewise, corresponds to the second point of the evolutionary naturalists, the dominant party. They say evolution is change. The question is whether change occurs. We say, no, that's not the question at all. That's not the important question. The important quality of living organisms is the enormous complexity of the information which is required to direct the life processes. Now, this will be the subject of Professor Meyer's talk on Wednesday, and so I'm setting you up to this point, and I'm just going to give you a brief preview of what the argument is here. Um, and it is that, um, uh, that one that can perhaps be most easily made by analogy, remembering that analogies are always imperfect, but they're often of great illustrative value, is if you think of the living cell, you have, you're said to have trillions of cells in your body, a bacterial cell, one of your cells, it doesn't matter. A, uh, what is a cell and what is it put together of? And let us compare and we'll compare it with a computer, uh, which is uh, the nearest analogy uh, that uh, uh, we have. Uh, in Darwin's day, the cell was supposed to be a, block of pro a blob of protoplasm. You see, just like one of those drops of water, only of some uh, you know, living substance. Very simple. And we now know that the cell is a masterpiece of miniaturized complexity, a billion or so proteins going around in it. Uh, a biochemist received the Nobel Prize last year for having discovered many years ago what he called zip code sequences in the proteins, which are the addresses, you see, to which they're to be sent to do the next jobs, which record the directions of what's to happen next and where they're to go and where to go after that. We see something that has to write those directions and has to read them. Uh, both, and in order for that to be a meaningful concept, the, the zip codes, just like on the postal uh, envelopes uh, that you uh, mail. Um, and uh, so uh, a, a, the cell is a masterpiece of miniaturized complexity that can be analogized perhaps to an entire city. And for, for this, these life processes to occur, there must be some directing program or agency which is analogous, at least, to the program that runs your personal computer. I say that that's telling all these things where to go and what to do and, and coordinating the life processes so that it isn't just chaos. Um, and um, if you think about what the operating system of a computer is, it's like a Windows uh, 2000 or the Macintosh system. It's millions of lines of meaningful text in the form of computer code. So, again, to change the analogy slightly, you can think of it as something like a, a book of instructions, a cookbook, if you like, the joy of cooking. You know, a thousand pages or so of recipes and directions. Uh, meaningful text. And meaningful text is something which is produced only by intelligence. Now, the, the, the technical language in which this is expressed it can be, you know, it's very, very simplified, but it's complex specified aperiodic genetic information. Um, and those those, those uh, jargon terms are easily explained. The, the, the information is complex. Well, it's like the millions of lines. There's lots of symbols. So it's complex. It's specified by the nature of the process it has to direct. You see, not any old arrangement of symbols will give you Windows 2000, only a particular one. So the whole arrangement is specified by the need to do that. Um, uh, so it's a specified complexity. Um, and it is aperiodic or non-repeating. What that means is it's not the same darn thing over and over again. That is important because that's what physical law gives you. Physical law gives you simple repetitive order, say like a snowflake or, or whatever. It's sometimes quite beautiful, uh, but it's the same thing over and over again, perhaps with certain mistakes. Um, a book which was produced by physical law could be emulated by programming the mac a macro into your word processor, repeat the word law, L-A-W, over and over again until a printer runs out of paper. 
Say so that's a simple order. Now, if you thought, well, we got a little bit of order, we've got a word here. So, you know, a little more work on the, the time, put enough paper in the printer, and you'll end up with a plays of Shakespeare. You see, that would be like waiting for that bathtub to fill up with aviation gasoline. It never happens because the same order, simple repetitive order that gives you the minimal order you get, prevents it from ever getting more intricate, more complex, it keeps it at that level. Uh, so our argument is, is that if you look at the nature, the inherent nature of genetic information without bias, you will say it is the kind of thing which cannot be produced by chance, which produces chaos, not order, or by law, which produces simple repetitive order, or a, by a combination of the two, especially because they work against each other. Uh, and so it is clear evidence pointing to the reality of an intelligence outside of nature. Um, and we argue that this kind of logic is recognized everywhere in science except in evolutionary, you know, origins theory, uh, because they're afraid it would point to the G word. Uh, uh, whereas, you know, uh, archaeologists use logic like this all the time to determine that an apparent cave painting really is a painting and not a, you know, product of natural erosive forces, for example. And even the great atheist Carl Sagan uh, you know, applied the same logic to try to determine whether signals from outer space might be from an intelligent civilization in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You look for complex, specified, aperiodic information. And my colleague, William Dembski, has developed this and, you know, his books into an entire system. But as I say, we'll wait for Meyer to say more about this. Well, that's our second point. Now, our third point addresses the inherit the wind stereotype, and we reverse it. You say, we are not the religious fundamentals. You are the scientific materialists. It is you who have imposed a fundamentally religious agenda, the materialist agenda on the scientific evidence, and are refusing to look at the evidence that's staring you in the face because of that prejudice. And it is staring them in the face. Richard Dawkins, the arch-Darwinist and scientific materialist, says that uh, biology is the study of extremely complex things that look as if they were designed for a purpose. And the job of the biologist is to show that they aren't, you see, by promoting Darwinism. Francis Crick, the other great atheistic uh, biologist, uh, says uh, that uh, biologists have to remind themselves every day that what they study was not designed, it evolved. And so they have to continually, you know, remind themselves of this, obviously, because otherwise the reality that is trying to get their attention uh, would get past their defenses. Uh, so... Uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, a position based on evidence. And uh, if anybody brings the Bible into this discussion, it's never us, of course, it's the other side. And they bring it in constantly. They say, I don't know why you want to talk about the Bible all the time. And, you know, we, we haven't mentioned it, but, you know, they've been talking about it nonstop, which really illustrates where the religious motivation uh, here is uh, uh, coming, uh, uh, coming from. So uh, those are the, you know, the, the fundamental differences in our uh, our way of looking at this uh, issue. Now, we in the intelligent design movement are extremely confident. Uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that over the years that I've been working on this and where I have learned you know, everything that the other side can throw at us and so on, that, that if the issues get fairly on the table for debate, the issues that we are raising, there is no question about who is going to win the debate. It will take time. It won't happen overnight because you're working against a lot of inertia and cultural power and so on. Uh, but um, uh, over a long period of time, uh, the, the public is going to side with us, and eventually that will come out in the scientific world. We have, you know, people are emerging all the time, slowly, bit by bit, you know, who are agreeing with us. And once they got the idea that it was permissible to raise these questions and to argue them, there would be a flood of this. So while the other side, the scientific materialists, seem to have an impregnable position, I often analogize it to the uh, position that the Soviet Union appeared to be in in the mid-1980s. You say that it was going to be around forever. It had all those missiles and, you know, uh, uh, troops and guns and so on. It looked, you know, impregnable, um, and yet it was collapsing from inside uh, because uh, uh, even its uh, leaders uh, began to lose their belief. Now, our leaders on the other side don't seem to have lost their belief, but in a very fundamental sense they have, because when you see a scientific establishment that is so desperate to keep critics off the table, to keep criticism from being heard, that wants to teach science in a just-believe-this-because-we-tell-it-to-you basis and don't raise questions, that's how we do science in this country, you know that they don't really believe 
in their scientific process, you say, that they don't trust it uh, to come to the, 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 to, to the right uh, answers to demonstrate the truth of the propositions uh, uh, that are true. Uh, if uh, they could win the debate, once it's all out on the table, they wouldn't be so desperate to keep it uh, off the table. So I feel beneath all the bluster, there is, in fact, a, a fundamental uh, insecurity uh, which we are facing. Now, what should be done about this uh, a question? They say, well, if there are many things in life that are complex. Or, you know, it's hard to find the right answer, the crime problem and all that. There are lots of things that are that way. This is one of the things that isn't very difficult to find the right answer about how to deal with it. Um, the, the right answer is quite apparent, and it's consistent with all of our traditions. In the first place, the proper place to have a debate over these issues in the first instance is in the universities. Okay? The universities ought to welcome this. The proper place in the first instance is not the high schools. It happens to come there because that's where the, you know, the people on the ground, that's where the parents can have a say and, you know, and so on. So the, the political process brings it in there. But where I really want to have it in the first instance is at Berkeley and, you know, Harvard and uh, places and, and, and the universities. And that is what we are trying to bring about. Um, just uh, last month, we had a major conference at Baylor University in uh, Texas uh, on the nature of nature. Raising directly this question, does the evidence of nature point to the need for a reality outside of nature? And uh, my colleague Bill Dembski, directing the conference for the Michael Polanyi Center there, uh, brought in the most star-studded conference that they have ever had, I, I, I would guess at Baylor, certainly for many years, or almost at any place, two Nobel Prize winners, Christian de Duve and uh, Steven Weinberg, my colleague John Searle from Berkeley and the world's most famous philosophers, professors from Harvard and, uh, uh, you know, many Big Ten schools, and really, really big names in it to debate this. Most of the big names, of course, are dead against us. You know, nature's all there is. Don't worry about it. Well, that's not the important thing. The important thing was they felt that they had to come and address the question in a major university forum, you know, under real academic rules. That's a huge step forward. I didn't, when I said I knew we were going to win, I didn't say we were going to win at the first conference, you see. It's eventually that this uh, position is going to uh, collapse and uh, there, there will be a, a change. Now, the reaction at Baylor University to this is that faculty members are trying desperately to close the Michael Polanyi Center. The faculty has demanded they sh that the president shut it down without delay because it has raised forbidden topics, you see, which they have opposed, and it will ruin their academic reputation. Now, this is all the more startling when you know that Baylor is a Southern Baptist university. Uh, but uh, if, if you understand how things are in Christian or nominally Christian higher education, you won't be surprised at all. That is where you find many people who are the most frightened uh, of an, an intellectual discussion on this uh, issue. Uh, so well, we're going to have discussions at other universities and so on, and eventually we're going to get the issue on the table. The Baylor Conference itself was, I say, a huge step forward. We're getting our books uh, published by uh, uh, a lot of different kinds of presses, and you know, we're, we're getting a tremendous public response, so we'll eventually get it there. Now, in the meantime, what should the public schools be doing, you know, or the high schools or whatever? Again, the answer to that is easy. They should teach the controversy. They say that, that, of course, they ought to teach their students what the mainstream scientific establishment thinks is true and why they think it's true and why they think it's important. That's useful knowledge. On the other hand, they should also teach why such a large number of people, including people with advanced degrees, are suspicious in one degree or another about it. They should come clean and be honest about just what the religious implications are. And say, now, what we have now, I've often described it, the National Academy of Sciences and the science educators operate on the two-platoon system. They have the offensive platoon. Edward O. Wilson, Richard Dawkins, uh, uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, uh, you know, other writers who are all major scientific figures who say, of course this is atheism. Now, of course we're teaching atheism here. We're teaching that God is not your creator, material processes are. And if you don't get the point, you're just stupid. And that's what they're all saying. Well, then somebody says, hey, doesn't this have religious implications? And the spokesman for the Academy of Science says, oh, no, we're not saying anything about religion. We're just teaching science, just harmless stuff about mosquitoes getting resistant to DDT. And the defensive platoon takes the field. And they say, oh, some scientists are very religious. 
You know, I mean, they may be anything. It doesn't tell you what they are. They're pantheists. They worship evolution. Um, or they, you know, they go to church on Sundays. Or the, um, uh, but um, uh, they, they, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll change the subject to something. Some, know, some scientists manage to be religious, you know, and, and isn't that wonderful? And so that shows that, you know, evolution is not saying anything against uh, religious belief. You see, well, well, of course, see, behind this, there is a, a way of thinking. Uh, what they mean is that you can still believe in whatever you want to believe in, God, the tooth fairy, or whatever. Uh, but what science teaches you is that nature did all the creating. And so they should come honest about that. So we should have honest teaching, which when there's a controversy, you know, out there in the public, which attempts to do the best they can within the limitations, you know, the educational process for the age group, to teach people why it's controversial and to develop their own thinking powers. But that is the last thing in the world that our opponents want to happen, is education, is real education, that develops critical and scientific thinking powers rather than education that teaches them what they're supposed to believe. And that's my message, and now I'd be glad to take questions. I think we're having some microphones uh, coming uh, through. If uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh, if uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh, if uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh, if uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh, if uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh, if uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh, if uh, you see, they'll, they'll see you, uh,